All right, we're going to start off in August of 1769. This is the first welcoming committee from Santa Barbara. In August of 1769, Gaspar de Portola was coming through California with the first land expedition. Their goal was to go from San Diego to San Francisco, where they hoped San Francisco. San Francisco Bay was known from sea, but not from land. So their idea was to find San Francisco Bay from the land side of it and report back. So this was the first expedi land expedition through California. In August, they came through Santa Barbara and the Chumash just turned out to be the most welcoming people they'd come across. They brought them food, they entertained them, and they had camped outside of Do what is now the Dos Pueblos ranch area at where there was two Chumash villages, hence the name Dos Pueblos. And Father Juan Crespi, who was a diarist for the expedition, had noted that there was about 1,100 people, which is a large community, living out at, this, at these two Indian villages. So he wrote that that night, the Chumash came before them after the campfires, and they, he said, they were not satisfied with simply spreading food before us, but desired to entertain us. Toward evening, the chief of each village came in paints and feather ornaments, holding in their hands split reeds, the motion and noise of which served to keep time to their chants and to their dances. This they performed so well and uniformly, it was very harmonious. However, the dances lasted all through the evening and we had a hard time ridding ourselves of them. We dismissed them, begging them by signs not to come back during, tonight, during the night to disturb us, but in vain. As soon as darkness set in, they returned blowing horns, the infernal noise of which was sufficient to rip our eardrums to pieces. And that was the first welcoming committee, Mikasa es su casa, as it were, that Santa Barbara offered to these new guests coming into town. And this tradition has stayed with us for years. For anybody that's ever had a block party or been out to Isla Vista, the noise continues all through the night. Our next celebration, this will be the recording of the first fiesta, the first recorded fiesta in Santa Barbara. This is what Mission Santa Barbara looked like in 1798. And we tend to think that the mission that we see before us is as it was built in 1786. But this mission has gone through several different changes through the years. So here's 1798. And then this drawing shows us what it looked like around 1812 and the Church part was still the same, a little bit larger, but mainly they had built the famous corridor that we have in front of us with the arches. In this case, it was an open top with a little scalloped uh, partition along the top there. However, in December of 1812, there was a massive earthquake which destroyed the church, left the corridor part pretty much intact, and so they had to build a new church. And it was in September of 1820 that the new church was finally finished, and it looked like that. They had added a roof over the corridor, and it was still open though to the top there. And notice that the mission only had at that time one bell tower. So this was a big fiesta to welcome the new Santa Barbara mission, and invitations were sent out all over the place. The musicians from the three area missions came down to provide entertainment. And Father Sooner of the mission wrote that uh, he wrote all the different guests that had come, the governor, military personnel, and Indians from everywhere. There was fireworks and bull baiting. They had written to the governor to be able to have a fireworks maker come up from San Diego, and he worked all summer making fireworks. Now I'm thinking Santa Barbara in September, and they're going to have fireworks displays. We know how bad it is already, and, but I guess they had something figured out because they went through the fireworks for a three-day celebration. They talked about all the fireworks going off. Well, the father listed, he wrote down the details of this fiesta, and he said, to give here a true account of what took place at the dedication of this new church and the celebrations so that in the future there may be evidence for it and it may be transmitted to posterity. Food, drink, and shelter were given to all who asked for or needed it, and they were given it on a grand scale. A man was appointed to serve the wine and brandy until all had had enough. Since the number of people was so large, it cost something, but the expenses were well applied because without all was clatter, merriment, and diversion. And thanks be to God, neither mishap, nor quarrel, nor complaint occurred. And what a splendid fiesta that must have been. Carried off beautifully, and of course, as it is today, it cost something, but everybody had 
a great time. One of our next fiestas, well recorded by Richard Henry Dana in his book, Two Years Before the Mast. In 1876, he was on the Hyde and Tallow ship, The Pilgrim, which was in Santa Barbara to observe. At, at that time, it turned out that the agent for their company, Alfred Robinson, was marrying one of the daughters of Jose de la Guerra, Ana Maria de la Guerra being his daughter, 16 years old. And the festivities took place at the de la Guerra Adobe. And everybody was invited. And Dana was just overwhelmed by this hospitality that it didn't matter if you had an invitation or not, you were expected to attend. So he wrote glowingly of this incredible wedding and it put Santa Barbara on this very romantic map of all these weddings. But there's another wedding I'd like to bring up that took place 10 years earlier, also with one of uh, da Jose de la Guerra's daughters, uh, Teresa de la Guerra, who married William Hartnell. While they were getting married in 1825, there was a ship showed up in the harbor. Uh, the captain of it was Captain Pedro Angulo, and he had led a mut mutiny against the ship's captains. They were in the Marianas Islands, which is about halfway between Japan and New Guinea. So the, he led a mutiny and they took over the ship through the Spanish captain and all his men onto these Mariana Islands. And then he sailed off looking for something to plunder and to rob, came into California, sailed into Santa Barbara and thought what a ripe community this might be. So he and his men came ashore and found themselves in the middle of this huge party going on. And so he tried to pass himself off as a French admiral and take in, well, he was invited anyway. And so he and his men came up to, at this time, the Presidio, the De La Guerra Adobe wasn't built yet. So at the Presidio, they were welcomed and wined and dined, but he tried to pass himself off as this French admiral. Well, William Hartnell spoke fluent French and immediately started blowing holes in the uh, Captain Pedro's disguise. So with his tail between his legs, the captain left Santa Barbara, boarded his ship, and as they were leaving the channel or leaving off Santa Barbara shore, they turned the ship and fired several cannons at the community. Now, if they intended to hit something, they failed miserably because all the people at the wedding festival thought this was a salute from the ship honoring the married couple. So the pirates crashing the wedding did not work out to his advantage. But once again, the hospitality of Santa Barbara to take anybody, invite them and send them off almost happy worked out just fine. Another chance for merriment was in January of 1842. This is Bishop Garcia Diego, from whom we have a high school named. Santa California had been finally appointed to have a bishop and Everybody was so excited that California was finally gonna have their own bishop. This is being Bishop Garcia Diego. And everybody was just delighted about it. So he was gonna establish his residency in San Diego, but he took one look at the community of San Diego and said they were too uncivilized for him. And so he chose Santa Barbara, which is kind of funny. We were a small community, hard to get to in the middle of nowhere. But Bishop Garcia Diego said Santa Barbara is the place. So he moved his residency here and the town was just thrilled. So in January of 1842, he arrived offshore, was rowed ashore, taken to the Aguirre Adobe at Anacapa and Carrillo Streets and was given food there. Leaving the grand luncheon, he headed up to the mission. So as he headed up to the mission, the townspeople unhitched the oxen from his cart and the men started pulling the cart by themselves by hand to take him up the rest of the way. The women had gone into the creek beds and cut reeds and rushes, and then they performed a large ceremonial arch along the way that the bishop passed through. So everybody was thrilled and happy. He got up to the mission in this drawing here by Alexander Harmer and turned and blessed the crowd and all was in happiness, except after about a couple of months or weeks. Turns out Bishop Garcia Diego was not too happy with the residents of Santa Barbara, who were rather sinful in his eyes. Uh, they had problems like the immorality of having fiestas on a Sunday, having barren bullfights in front of the mission. There was a number of illegitimate, illegitimate children and a lot of gambling and other vices. So he would lecture the community on Sunday from the pulpit and they weren't too keen about it. And so it was a few months later in July of 1842, the bishop was out for a ride with one of the padres from the mission, Father Doroteo, Father Doroteo Ambris, 
And as they were passing just outside the town, there was a festival of some kind going on. And part of the festival was to have probably a barren bull fight. The bull got away and the people were chasing the bull. Some say the people chased the bull directly at the bishop's carriage. And the bull was already upset and saw that carriage headed straight for it and hit the mule, disemboweling it and knocking the carriage over. Well, the padre on the carriage said it was with great sadness that he watched this exuberance as the crowd more or less in encouraged the bull to knock over the carriage. Bishop Garcia Diego was trapped under the carriage when it overturned and the priest wrote that the bishop and myself wept at such an incident that this would happen. Well, Father Duran was so upset about that, he preached from the pulpit the next week saying that he was ashamed that any news of this should leave this community and people find out how we treated the bishop. Well, all was forgiven because in 1846, Bishop Garcia Diego passed away. The townspeople had came and celebrated a great funeral for him. And now he's buried on the altar at Mission Santa Barbara. Another place for great celebrations in Santa Barbara was La Para Grande, the giant grapevine in Montecito. It was planted by Maria Dominguez and her husband, Jose. And it, became, it spread and covered, I don't know how, quite a few acre, an acre or more. And it became the celebratory place for the people of Montecito. The dances were held there. Any celebration was held there, weddings, baptisms. During the American period, it became a place to vote. So it was the, it was the community center of Montecito. Well, around 1871, a man named Michael Sarver purchased a few acres from the Dominguez family. And so he fixed it up a little bit, started putting up signs, put on a dance floor, took a lot of photographs and had them made for souvenirs and started celebrating Montecito's giant grapevine. And so tourists coming to Santa Barbara, this was one of the places they were encouraged to go to, to come out there and participate in the dances and the celebrations, and also to have to pass through the saloon that Mr. Sarver had as you went to the grapevine, you had to pass through the saloon and probably buy a drink or two as admission to get there. And so he had souvenirs that he sold and always going pretty well with this until 18, late 1875, early 1876. The grapevine was found to be dying. And so they decided they had to do something with it. So they cut it down and, oh, this is it from the top. So this is how it is here. It, covered some 5,000 square feet. There were 7,000 bunches of grapes picked annually. And so it was doing quite well until it got sick. So this is a view looking east into the Montecito Valley from Par what is now Para Grande Lane and the men standing on top of it. So this was, set, this was cut down and cut into sections, sent to the Philadelphia Exposition, the grand centennial of the United States in 1876. It was sent there and reassembled and was a great tourist attraction showing the wonderment of Santa Barbara. And you can see the sign there in the background saying Mammoth Grapevine. After the exhibition, it was taken apart and taken to Mr. Sarver's farm in Ohio, where he had originally come from and disappeared from view after that. But the name still remains to tell us of what used to be there in the heart of old Spanish town, the giant grapevine that brought the community together. Also for the centennial, we have the first recorded July 4th parade that I have found. This was a photograph taken by the photography team of Hayward and Mazal, and that's the Arlington Hotel in the background, which had just been opened in February of 1876. The hotel on the grounds covered the entire block, surrounded by State, Chapala, Victoria, and Sola Streets, and that's where today we have the Arlington Theater. But this is what it looked like in 1876 for the July 4th parade. It was a grand parade. There were 800 people in the procession and we had a, a population of 3,000. So that was quite a turnout of people that were in the parade. So 100 people on horseback, 123 wagons, and a grand celebration for 1876. Another centennial came about in 1886 for Mission Santa Barbara. So it was on its 100th birthday. And you can see from this picture how sort of there's a lot of plaster falling off. You can look down above the arches and there's windows there, but you can also see sections of plaster that have fallen off. Well, the Padres at the mission 
these few Franciscans, they take a vow of poverty, so they had no money. And this picture was actually taken in 1883, and this was a gathering of all the Franciscans in California. The gentleman in the center in the light robe with his hands folded is Father Sanchez. He was the oldest Franciscan missionary in Santa Barbara, or in California rather, having come here in 1841 with Bishop uh, Diego Garcia Diego. Well, the Franciscans were perplexed. They had no money. So what do you do? The same thing we always do. You have a party to repair the mission. So people got together, started having different sort of pageants and fundraisers at Libero's Theater. This state, in this case, it was 25 cents admission and the community raised the money, even though not everybody was a Catholic, Protestants, Jewish, everybody agreed that the mission was important to our history. So they all pitched together and raised the money to repair the mission. And so in the summer of 1886, it started under, work started underway and you can see a gentleman there in front of the mission building. There's a long ladder and so he's up there starting to doing plastering and uh, painting. And you can also see at the far left of this photograph where some of the large pieces of plaster have fallen off exposing the adobe underneath. And so everything was going very well. The mission got repaired. They had a grand celebration. So this is State Street just a little while, a few years before the centennial. So that's what it looked like. And now we take a look at what it looked like for the centennial parade. And the parade was phenomenal. We had Civil War soldiers, we had Presidio uh, descendants marching in it. And curiously and delightfully enough, they also had a contingent of the Chumash that were in the parade. And afterwards, everybody went up to the mission and had celebrations and different things up there. And here's a close up. There's an arch at State Street and Figueroa Street. That's Our Lady of Sorrows Church to the right of that tower there. So this, this piece is about, is 80 feet wide and about 60 or so feet tall. A little bit of a close up now. The spiral you see in the background, the spires of the Presbyterian Church built in 1875, the San Marcos or Elwood Hotel behind that, and Our Lady of Sorrows Church just off to the right. Well, one of the delightful things, again, about this was they spent three or four days celebrating the Mission Centennial, and a lot of it took place at Libero's Theater. This is exactly where the Libero's Theater is today. This is what originally looked like, one of the largest adobe buildings in California. Libero insisted on adobe because the acoustics were so perfect inside. Well, one of the highlights of the evenings at the Libero was the Chumash Indians got together, went on stage, and sang their songs and did their dances. And that's probably the last time anybody saw or witnessed something like that. So if I could go back in time, this is one of the occasions that I would go to, be able to be able to see the original, and actually go back to Portola's time when they had the song, singing and dancing for that. But what an, an amazing event for Santa Barbara in 1886 to have this. A year later, the first train to Santa Barbara. Now, the it was in 1869 that the Transcontinental Railroad was finished, you know, linking the East Coast to the West Coast, and it took seven years to put that together. Now, as soon as the Transcontinental Railroad was finished, and you could now go into Sacramento by train, the talk was how to get the railroad to Santa Barbara. And a way to do that started almost immediately, and just as quickly dissolved as just about every issue does in Santa Barbara, into rival factions, each with the same goal, but having diverse and self-centered reasons for their differences. There were railroad committees of the most influential citizens reformed, meetings organized, they had special elections, and we had three or four newspapers at that time, each one backing a certain idea of which railroad and how it should come to Santa Barbara. But it finally took 18 years for this to come through. It, twice, more than twice as long as it took to build the railroad from across the United States to get the railroad to Santa Barbara. So in August 19th, 1887, here's the first train coming into Santa Barbara. And the townspeople were there. There was outsiders coming from all over. This first train brought 300 people with it, including the Carpentria Band, which entertained people for quite a few hours. So this is uh, State Street is to the photographer's back. The church you see at the left is just in from the corner of Anna, Kappa, and Gatera streets. And there's a second picture, which I don't currently have a copy of, 
that little girl that's in white at the lower left-hand side of the screen, she turned and faced the camera for the second shot. And it is such a delightful and yet haunting photograph of her face frozen in time at this very important thing. It's just a stunning picture. Well, two more trains arrived. And then on Saturday, the following day, some more trains arrived. So all in all, it was estimated there were some 6,000 people in Santa Barbara for the arrival of this train. There was great parties at the Arlington and dances and music. And it was on Saturday, the following day, that there was a grand parade which started at Ortega Street, headed down State Street. It was a mile long procession. Coming to the foot of State Street, they then went over to this green area that I've outlined a place called Burton's Mound between Chapala, Bath, the Oceanfront, and Montecito Streets. And so there a grand picnic was held for the 6,000 people in Santa Barbara. And Santa Barbara's population was about 4,500 to 5,000 at that time. So there's more people in Santa Barbara than there were Santa Barbarians. Nevertheless, the ladies of Santa Barbara and the gentlemen put on a barbecue with pastries and desserts and everything else and entertained and fed all of our visitors. Mikasa es su casa. Now, the train stopped in Santa Barbara. It only got as far as Elwood, and it also stopped in San Luis Obispo area by Templeton. It wasn't until 1901 that finally we were connected to San Francisco directly by rail. So but this is what it was like in 1887 for our grand celebration for the arrival of the train. Well, just about this time, a group of women got together and said, it's time Santa Barbara had a hospital. And so they started raising money, talking to architects, and they decided to call this hospital the Cottage Hospital. The architect, Peter J. Barber, our former, he was a mayor and also a renowned architect, he estimated it would cost around $6,000. Well, by 1889, they'd only raised $3,000, and so they needed more money, so they got a few bucks extra. And finally, coming into 1890, they were short some 27 or so hundred dollars. So they thought, what can we do about this? Well, there's Libero's Theater and an opportunity for yet a week-long carnival. So the Santa Barbara Hospital, the Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital Group put on a four to five day, five day carnival. Every day they issued a newspaper like this one we have in front of us. And all the merchants in town, of course, bought advertising in it. And it gave the schedule of all the events. Every day there was something different going on to bring people back and back again and back again. There was all types of different booths that had a lot of different things. There was a Swedish booth that had Swedish food. There was a Swiss booth with Swiss food, Swiss, Swiss food. There was also a Turkish booth, which, fe which featured cigarettes and coffee. So there's the hospital raising money by selling tobacco. But well, they wouldn't be doing that today. Uh, here's some, another part of it, the grand march of the Spanish dancers and who the participants were. So every day something went on. So they needed $2,000 and the five-day carnival raised $2,700.53. So they had a surplus of $700.53. And the hospital then, they had the money, the hospital was built and it opened in December 8th, 1891. And that's what Cottage Hospital looked when it first opened. And it was on the same block that it sat today. It was on a different corner. It was on uh, Quinto and Castillo Street. But uh, that's what it looked like. And it was thanks to the people of Santa Barbara having yet another cause for celebration and to raise money and they did. Now this is not Santa Barbara, this is Pasadena. And Santa Barbara and Pasadena have always had a grand rivalry. And a few years back, the Pasadena Historical Society came up to Santa Barbara and I gave a talk to them at the Carriage Museum and did a little jokingly thing about the rivalry between the two communities. And there's a lot of families that had houses in both cities. And so it was a, there was a close rivalry going on there. So the question has always been, who has had the longest festivals. And Santa Barbara had citrus festivals and rose festivals long before Pasadena had theirs on January 1st, 1890. So technically, because theirs has been continually running, they have had the longest one. But we certainly were there first with our rose festivals. And we also had some that ran for six years following the 1890 Pasadena one. But I want to show you a little bit of difference between our festivals and theirs. So here we are looking at the Pasadena Hunt Club 
and the archway that they built over their dirt street with a stagecoach that almost fits underneath their archway and the stagecoach is decorated nicely as is the arch with flowers. So let's take a look at Santa Barbara on April 24th, 1891 when President Benjamin Harrison came to Santa Barbara. So here's Pasadena. Here's Santa Barbara, an 80 foot arch spanning State Street, 40 feet high. It reads Harrison in 1841 on the one side, honoring his grandfather, William Henry Harrison, and also on the other side, Harrison in 1889, celebrating our president's uh, election. And the archway is filled with flowers. There's a portrait of the president up on top. So here's the comparison between between uh, Pasadena and Santa Barbara. And so there's Pasadena, Santa Barbara. We rocked as far as arches go. Now there was also a huge flower parade as part of that welcoming of the, of the president to Santa Barbara. But let's take a look back at Pasadena. Now here's an entry in the Rose Parade and what a marvelous job they've done. They've got this nice little white pony and they put a few flowers around his harness and there's one on his nose a bouquet sitting on his back. And look at the work they've done to decorate the wheels of the carriage. They've got flowers all along it. And that poor boy with his sister not looking too happy about having to guide his sister through the parade apparently. But that's Pasadena's entry for their Rose Parade. Here's Santa Barbara's entry for the Flower Festival of 1891. These two ladies with their horses. Now that is a display of roses and horse and flowers all over the place. Behind them is a stagecoach covered with some 10,000 calla lilies. There was 30 or 40 carriages and stagecoaches and floats like this, thousands of flowers put on it. So let's take a look back. Pasadena versus Santa Barbara. Who does it better, I ask you? And I can see those of you that are voting are tallying right now and Santa Barbara is just going off the charts. Thank you for your honest online voting there. Well, the 1891 Flower Festival did so well that they decided to repeat it. So for 1892, et cetera. So here's 1894, the program for the Flower Festival. Each year, different artists came up with beautiful ideas to do this, sort of like our Fiesta posters and our Summer Solstice posters. Here's a view from the Arlington Hotel veranda, or from the tower rather, looking down on State Street. And you can see the bleachers set up and some of the parade entrance coming by. In the center of your photograph, you can see a two-story building. That's the school that is at the property of Ariaga and Anna Kappa, which is now the Notre Dame School. It was Dolores School when I went there. And then moving over to the right of your screen, you can see a white building uh, just about centered towards the right. And that is the St. Mark's Episcopal Church. And that church is still with us. It's moved several times, originally at the corner of Anna Kappa and Mitchell Terena. And now it is on Chapala Street, just above Mission. And a close up, looking at the parade along State Street between Sola and Victoria Streets. And notice over there to the right, just uh, in from the corner, you can see two gentlemen on bicycles. Bicycles were very important in the, in the parades. The bicycle brigades of Santa Barbara were very popular. And so the parades began with the bicyclists all decorated with flowers. In this case, these two gentlemen put two bicycles together. They made a sail out of flowers. And so they had a great fiesta entry, <coughs> or series flower festival entry. And notice there's a gentleman pushing a bicycle behind them. You know, I forgot to toast everybody. They gave me a glass of wine here, so there's your toast, thank you. I'll drink that when we're done. Now, the Santa Barbara's flower festivals became known nationwide and they were covered in all the news media. Demarest Family Magazine wrote a great article about the Santa Barbara Flower Festival. The mother of twins, I can read this here, mother of twins takes an outing. So this was a whole thing about this woman whose husband gallantly says, I will take care of the twins so you can go to Santa Barbara for the flower festival. So she and her girlfriends come up on the train, enjoy Santa Barbara for the week and the flower festival. So it was things like this that were just bringing tourists like crazy to Santa Barbara to enjoy this. 
Photographer N.H. Reed, one of our premier photographers, put together a floral festival catalog so that people could buy this and send it to their friends. Here is a view of all the different arches on State Street, the length of State Street. And again, these are 80 feet wide, 40 to 60 feet tall, just covered completely with flowers. And there was also, in addition to the parade, there was balls and there was dances. And in this case, this was the flower ball program for 1893. And inside was a list of all the different numbers that were going to be played by the band. And it came with a little pen so that you would write who your dance partner was. So if you were single and came across somebody, unlike today, we're, or not like today because we can't do it, but in my day, we wrote down the person's name and phone number in a matchbook cover from the dance hall, wherever we were at. But back then, they had a beautifully printed brochure with the names of the dances. So you remember which girl and which dance or which guy and which dance you had been with. This is the 1895 Flower Festival program and poster, which the museum has the original. And this again was done by premier Santa Barbara artist, Alexander Harmer. And uh, the girl in the center is one of his daughters. Well, the festivals only lasted until 1896. They took so much energy to put on and other Southern California cities seeing the success of Santa Barbara's festivals started doing festivals of their own. So we started getting less and less attendance. So they finally closed, closed it in, 1890, in 1896. And I just like this shot. In any occasion, the Santa Barbara musicians would get together, the early shot of Lorenzo Martinez, James Paul Garcia and friends serenading everybody down State Street. <coughs> Excuse me, everybody. Okay. 1901 in May, President William McKinley came to Santa Barbara. This is his train parked at the railroad depot at the time, which was on Rancheria Street in Anapamu, which is now Highway 101. It was called the Victoria Street Station, even though it was at the corner of Anapamu, but that's just how Santa Barbara things are. So the train arrived and dropped him off. He was taken on a beautiful rose-covered carriage drawn by four beautiful white horses, taken through a parade up State Street. He went to the Arlington Hotel where he gave a grand speech. There he is in the center with his hands uh, at his waist, without a microphone, without a megaphone, addressing a crowd at well over a thousand. Uh, to his right, the gentleman that is, or to our right, his left, the gentleman standing there with his head slightly down, is Mayor Charles Stork, the father of the news press, later news press publisher, Tom Stork. Uh, from there, Mr. McKinley went to the mission and then back to his train and was off to San Francisco. Uh, subsequently, a few months later in September, he was in Buffalo, New York, where he was shot by an assassin and died. And Vice President Theodore Roosevelt became president at that point. This is a shot from September 1902. It's Labor Day, and as part of the Labor Day celebration, the gentlemen, the, the plasterers, the electricians, and the carpenters that were building the Potter Hotel came down the Cabrillo Boulevard to Plaza del Mar. So Cabrillo Boulevard, at that time, just known as West Boulevard, dead-ended at Castillo. So this is the parade, and in the background is a Potter Hotel still under construction in September of 1902. But I just thought this was such a nice photograph uh, of these tradesmen having their parade. And now back to Theodore Roosevelt. So in May of 1903, President Roosevelt came to Santa Barbara. He, his train stopped at the Miramar Depot at the Miramar Hotel. From there, he was taken through Montecito, taking a little tour of Montecito, and then came down the boulevard. And so there he is in his carriage at lower right. You can see him sitting in a light colored suit. And he's followed by forest rangers and a parade of all types of horsemen and notable people. So at the plaza, here he is giving a speech. And in dead center, there you can see a cleared area and a table. And he is to the left of that table. You can see him slightly hunched over addressing the crowd. Now looking at that table is our reference point. Moving to our right, we can see a gentleman sitting down, looks like he's taking notes. And then to the right of him, you can see a man standing up. And if you look closely, you can see he's got a big camera there about ready to take a shot. So there's Teddy giving his speech. Again, no microphone, no megaphone. His voice 
carrying over to the throngs, again, estimated at well over a thousand. So that photographer is about to take the shot and there's the shot he snapped. A great picture of the president, just the quintessential Teddy Roosevelt type pose. Now among the many celebrities in the audience that were introduced to the president was the Our Lady Lighthouse Keeper up on the Mesa, Julia Williams, who had been there for over 40 years and served under any number of presidents. And uh, so I'm hoping that some of you have seen Betsy Green's talk about um, Ms. Williams and her experiences at the lighthouse up on the Mesa. So anyway, great shot of President Roosevelt coming to Santa Barbara and enjoying the throngs and the parades welcoming him here. He, of course, did go to Mission Santa Barbara and took a tour there. And upon leaving Mission Santa Barbara, we've got this drawing here. And you can see the mission on the left, which I did a very nice job of coloring in the roof tiles. And then to the right of the screen, we see a place highlighted. If you've ever walked along the Guna Street across from Roosevelt School, you'll see a giant wall surrounding the property. And that was the wall that separated the Clinton B. Hale property and enclosed it's a six foot tall at least sandstone wall. So that's what's in green down there. So as the president left Mission Santa Barbara, came down the Guna Street and made a right hand turn at Pedregosa, as he's passing that house, one of the outriders, Harry Hollister, a son of William Wells Hollister, who one of the great benefactors for Santa Barbara and built a lot of the things that we have here, the Arlington Hotel being one of his investments. Well, Harry Hollister pointed, uh, pulled up alongside the president's carriage and said, Mr. President, see the two women on the porch of that house, one of them dressed in black? And the president said, yes. And he said, that is Stanley Hollister's mother. Well, Stanley Hollister, another of the sons of William Hollister, had been in the Rough Riders with President Roosevelt in Cuba. Uh, Stanley was shot and wounded, was taken to a hospital, which he caught yellow fever and died. So as soon as the president, even though he was under the gun to get down to his, his, co his train and leave on time, stopped everything, told them, take this carriage up the driveway. And so he left his procession, went onto the porch and gave his condolences to Mrs. Hollister, talking to her about uh, her son and how much he meant to him. And I forgot to mention that the house, uh, the Clinton B. Hale house, uh, Mrs. Hale was Jenny Hollister, a daughter of Colonel Hollister and Annie Hollister. So that's why Mrs. Hollister was on the front porch there. So what a great guy to, knowing that he's under uh, appointments to get out of Santa Barbara, but yet stopped everything to pay his condolences to Mrs. Hollister and talk to her about her son Stanley and how much he enjoyed his company and his companionship during his time in, in Cuba. Well, now the president had to get to the railroad station. So on the top left of your screen, you can see where Mrs. Hollister was at the Hale residence and where I'm kind of blocking it, but just below my name, there's a little green section there. That's where the railway station was. So the president's procession just flew down the streets, all dirt paved. There were no paved streets in Santa Barbara then. So they flew down there, the forest rangers and other horsemen riding quickly ahead of the president to block off the intersection so that nobody would interfere with the carriage. So it went lickety split through the streets of Santa Barbara, got to the railway station, in time for the president to leave. He was supposed to depart at two o'clock and two o'clock it was as it pulled out. According to legend, the president got on the back of the train and waved his hat to all the outriders and said, gentlemen, I like the way you ride. And off he went to San Francisco. This was a fun shot. I found this on eBay and I didn't win it. I got outbid, but I made a copy of it and had no idea what this was. It just completely intrigued me. It was obviously a parade of some kind with all the banners. I figured it was a July 4th celebration. Well, one of the things I'm researching is the first automobiles in Santa Barbara. So I've been putting together quite a list of all the different things going on. July 4th, 1905, I found this article about the parade, which said this was the first parade with a horseless carriage in it. And I looked at that and I said, that is no horseless carriage. But as I read the article, what these two gentlemen had done, uh, John Longawa, and I forget who his partner was in this, partner in crime, they had put together this buckboard of some kind. They put a steering wheel on it, so it was like a car. And then to the back, it's not a horse, it's a mule. So therefore, they called it a horseless carriage. 
And behind the mule, you can see a, a young man walking, and his job was to prod the mule every time it stopped. Well, the judges for the parade had no idea what to do with this entry because it was not, didn't fall under any category they had. So they gave it an award for horribles, and they took second place in the horribles category. And they got, uh, anyway, that was their notoriety for it. So the first horse's carriage in a Santa Barbara parade. Well, President Roosevelt theoretically came back to Santa Barbara in April of 1908. The Great White Fleet, all these 16 battleships painted white, sent around the world by President Theodore Roosevelt to show the might of our Navy and to show its peaceful intent by having all of them painted white. Santa Barbara had the great fortune of having all 16 battleships arrive here on April 26, 1908. As they came down into the channel, Edwin Spalding wrote about, or Edward Spalding wrote about this and said, it looked like the ships were heading directly towards shore and not gonna stop. Suddenly, all 16 battleships turned as one and then started heading up the channel. And people thought, oh my God, they're going to just completely bypass us. They must have missed the instructions. And then almost as a dime as a battleship could possibly do, all 16 battleships then turned and pointed to Santa Barbara and sat in the channel. They dropped anchor at the same time. And you think of Santa Barbara, there's no airplanes, there's no highway, it's just dead quiet. 16 battleships dropped anchors simultaneously. And Mr. Spalding wrote that the sound was so loud and overwhelming, it came across the city hit the mountain wall and bounced all the way back out to the channel again. He said a spectacle like this he had never seen again in his life. Well, for the next six days, it was a magnificent party in Santa Barbara. There was more sailors on those 16 battleships than there were people in Santa Barbara. So there was dances, there were balls, there were sporting activities with the sailors versus the locals and everybody had a great time. Also, all the bars were closed and uh, for the occasion. So the highlight of it was the Sailors Parade on April 28th, the Battle of the Flowers, in which 1,600 sailors came down the boulevard, came to Plaza del Mar, made a loop, and then headed back down the boulevard the other direction, all the while being pelted with flowers from all the delightful young ladies of Santa Barbara who just thought these gentlemen, these officers and sailors in their crisp white uniforms were just the most handsomest things they'd ever seen. And the sailors were then followed by just about the entire community with floats and carriages. This is another Alexander Harmer painting that's in the collection here at the Santa Barbara Historical Museum. The coach in the foreground with the beautiful white horses decorated with gold trim and gold flowers was done by um, Stuart Edward White, who was a famous novelist and one of his grandsons or great-grandsons is our former city councilman, Bendy White. So Mr. White was in charge of everything for the parade. So this is a magnificent painting showing the procession coming down Cabrillo Boulevard. And I've seen the photographs of this and everything is just spot on accurate. An excellent job by Mr. Harmer. So once again, we had all the great flower bedecked carriages. We also had Oh, automobiles, maybe a half dozen automobiles highly decorated were in the parade. And on this photograph, you see this battleship, two gentlemen pulled the body off of their car. And so just with the chassis and engine, they built a battleship around it. And so here it is coming down. It got one of the awards. I'm not sure if it was sweepstakes, but got one of the awards for the best presentation. Now on the right, you can see a cameraman leaning over looking at his camera. And then slightly above him to the right, there's another gentleman, one of the Navy men, all in white, and he has what appears to be a movie camera. And so this is something one of us has got to research and find out, does the Library of Congress happen to have any copy of that film? And does it still exist of the Great White Fleet Parade in Santa Barbara in 1908? Well, with all these ship's men coming ashore at different times, uh, Everybody was well behaved. The newspapers just praised the sailors and how well everybody was, including our citizenship. So everything was going great, except for what we will call the incident here at John Stenix Cafe. And you can see the demolished entrance to this store at 121 State Street. 
It says the result of beef, steak, and eggs, $6.15. The sailors claim that they got this outrageous bill for their meals for two sailors. And so that's why they came back during the night and demolished the restaurant. Nobody was found guilty. Nobody was arrested. But just to make it fair, uh, I read John Senek's account. And what he said was five sailors came into the restaurant, ordered their meal. Three of them got up and left. We were replaced by three other sailors who then ordered meals and then claimed that they had nothing to do with the three that had left. So that was the fight over the $6.15. Senek said, no, you actually had you know, eight people here. And they said, no, we only had five. And so that's where the troubles started. Well, he lost his restaurant for a couple of days as it got demolished and uh, nobody got the blame and everybody left. A few days later, the fleet sailed out much to all the heartbroken young damsels of Santa Barbara. Battleships arrived again in 1933. There was um, five battleships arrived in June of 1933. And so Santa Barbara put on the Semana Nautica Fleet Week, which again had all these waterfront sporting activities between the sailors on the ships and the local Santa Barbans. And it was such a hit that it just kept on going year after year. So here's 1938, Semana Nautica, the uh, schedule of events, which I won't go into because they're several pages long, but just the celebration of our waterfront and bringing people to Santa Barbara and welcoming them. By the 1950s, a great part of the Semana Nautica was the Battle of the Flower, something we have seen time and time again through all of our different Santa Barbara celebrations. And the woman behind the Battle of the Flowers is this powerhouse here behind the microphone at the just left, just to the right of center on your photograph, the woman in the blue dress. That's Maria Margelli. And Maria Margelli just loved to put on pageants. And so she started the Battle of the Flowers in 1949 for Semana Nautica. She then added a nativity pageant at the harbor, an Easter pageant at the harbor. She started the arts and crafts uh, program at Fiesta in 1955 on the last Sunday of Fiesta. So that was another one of her creations. She also started the Columbus Day landing. She also had the landing of Cabrillo. So anything she could do to have an excuse for a pageant at the waterfront, Maria Margelli was there at most delightful, energetic lady. And of course, this arts and crafts show on the Sundays of Fiesta has trans, trans what we would call it, transformed itself and moved on. So it is, or it was, <laughs> let's recorrect that. It was a weekly Sunday uh, phenomenon along East Beach, but now it's, uh, I think, definitely closed due to our current situation. Well, here's another delightful one. Mountain Drive, the community up on Mountain Drive has had all types of delightful festivals for the beatnik, pre-hippie people, whatever you want to call them that lived up there. Uh, historian Elias Chakos has written a wonderful book on the Mountain Drive, which you can buy at all of our local Santa Barbara bookstores. Uh, this is a scene recreated of, of a, the Mountain Drive grape stomp for a movie called Seconds, which was filmed in 1966 with Rock Hudson in the lead. So all the Mountain Drivers got to uh, go back. You can see the big vat there on the upper left as uh, they go up there and grape stomp. And at one point, I think they pull off their clothes and dance nude into the grapes. But another wonderful uh, set of Santa Barbara traditions up on Mountain Drive. Then of course, we do have the summer solstice. This was started by Michael Gonzalez, a Santa Barbara artist, mime, and just delightful person to celebrate his birthday. And I think it was just him and a friend marching up State Street in 1874. And that evolved into the summer solstice, which draws, again, tens of thousands of people to Santa Barbara to just see the creativity and to party and to have fun. And uh, just an uh, interesting shot. This is somewhere in the mid-30s to late 30s. I have no idea what this parade is all about, but that's a very early Mickey and Minnie Mouse. They uh, eventually changed quite a bit. These guys almost look scary. So I have no idea what the parade was for. I have yet to find that out, but there they are. Also throw this out for you. This is the July 4th parade in Santa Barbara. And that panel truck snuck into the parade. Now, if you notice the American flag, uh, the shield that's painted on the side, it's bright yellow with the chartreuse of the panel truck and black stripes. 
and a black dot in the center. Well, when you have colors like that, which I've seen in many books, you stare at the black dot in the center for 30 to 60 seconds, and then you look at a white background and you see red, white, and blue. So I don't know what the, what the phenomenon is called, but it's just a thing that I've seen many times. So the people in this truck I have identified as Neil Graffy and his wife at the time, the late Ginger Volkman, and they painted this truck up. They snuck into the parade. They got behind the MG Club on Ariaga Street, and when the parade marshal waved the MGs through, these two miscreants drove this panel truck into the parade, which the marshals just thought they should be here. The truck slowed down and then went down State Street slowly so people could stare at the black dot where the shield is for a few seconds and then look at the white space and see the American flag as they looked at that. And we, people just loved it. It, it went over very well. And then to make sure that we were a seemingly legitimate entry, the back of the truck had a sign that said, thank you for your cooperation, the American Color Blindness Institute. So it's a delightful way to sneak into a parade. And so we look back at some of these celebrations and kind of these all look the same. There at the top left, we have the Chumash celebrating with their dances. Top right, we have the first Fiesta in 1924 with the second Arlington Hotel in the background. And at lower left, we have the Mountain Drive community with the Grape Stomp. And then we also have uh, the same summer solstice with the great parade and celebration that they have. And those, the, though these are all different eras, different people, and different times, what is still remaining the same is the reason we get together then as now is to break up the hardships of our daily lives, ignore our differences, and eat and drink, sing and dance together. And that closes our production of fiestas, festivals, and parades. I thank you very much for attending. And now I will enjoy my sip of wine.